Hello, I'm Taj Greenlee, Associate Director of 92Y Talks. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our event, Frank Langella in conversation with Roger Rosenblatt, Netflix's trial of the Chicago 7. This deeply engaging and thoughtful conversation brings together the legendary four-time Tony Award winner and screen performer, Frank Langella who's masterfully embodied a variety of roles, from King Lear to Dracula to President Richard Nixon, and most recently, Judge Julius Hoffman in Aaron Sorkin's The Trial of the Chicago 7, now available on Netflix. He's also the author of Dropped Names, Famous Men and Women as I Knew Them. Frank is joined by the esteemed Roger Rosenblatt, a longtime friend of the 92nd Street Y. Roger is a three-time New York Times best-selling author whose latest book, Cold Moon, is currently available for purchase. And now, please enjoy this 92i Talks event, Frank Langella in conversation with Roger Rosenblatt. Thanks for coming. Hello, Frank. How are you? I'm very well, Roger. How are you? I'm well, and I'm always better for seeing you. So we're going to we're supposed to talk and kill some time and be interesting and entertaining. Do you think we can do that? I think so. I'm just trying to see where I put myself. I think this is fine, right? Yeah. You, oh, you look great. Yeah, you look fine. Uh, I, was I never looking at the background. <laughs> What's that? I was looking at the background to see if there was anything that was disturbing, but there isn't. No, it's very effective. The people you had do your lighting really worked well. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought for, we start out talking about art and life, or as in, in your case, acting and living. And uh, you've done so much so well, it really is breathtaking. As much as I like to tease you, it, it is an astonishing career. When you have a, a complicated role like Lear, like King Lear, and a role that others have done before you in a variety of ways, how do you think about it? Well, first I watch every other Lear uh, to see what I can steal, to see what works, what doesn't work. And I kind of watch very carefully. And then I let it all go. And whatever affected me in Paul Schofield's Lear, which was my favorite, and other Lears stays in my head. But I don't, I don't write it down. And I don't say I must do it exactly. Sometimes I say, well, that isn't anything I thought of. So that's good. I learned something from it. It never frightens me to see another actor playing a part on the back. I think that's a very good sign in art generally. Actually, it doesn't frighten me when I also steal from another writer. Uh, the, the idea is I'm lost in admiration and I show my admiration by stealing left and right. Yeah. I agree. You, um, you take a, uh, a part like Lear and you have a very strong personality. You have, you have your own mind. You are not, uh, not uh, a sieve or uh, passive when you look at it. So what do you bring of Frank Langella to King Lear? Oh, everything. Um, I'm about to be 83. When I did Lear, I was in my 70s. And uh, I thought, oh, I'm playing this old man. I'm too young for him. Uh, everything about my mortality, my uh, control freak side of my personality, all of those things which are Lear in the very first scene, uh, I, I grabbed onto. And then there's a particular point in the play when Lear realizes quite clearly uh, that he's not going to be able to give orders anymore that are going to be obeyed, and that he wasn't in the end loved by these girls. They were just afraid of him, like the three children at present in related to our current, current leader. <laughs> and it, what dawns on him is, I thought they were doing it because they cared. They were doing it because I held the power and I had on the um, crown. And now that I don't anymore, I realize in that beautiful speech he has about the naked man lying before him, is this all we are? And he comes to that uh, conclusion and then goes mad, you know. How do you, how do you prevent that perception? 
which goes deep. How do you prevent that perception from ending in bathos and where you start to feel sorry for yourself? Talent. And uh, talent. Does, does talent make uh, bring life to even um, well, in that Lear, moment? Lear is not a play. It's 15 plays in 15 scenes. And if you try to approach Lear and indeed many other Shakespeare roles, uh, there's no psychological follow up from scene to scene. You have to leap, as it were, from one scene to another and play them as whole plays, just as they are. So in each one of those scenes, I had to find the heart of what he was at that moment. Huh. Not think, well, in the last scene, I said this because it doesn't make any difference. When he comes on with the crown of thorns, it's totally different than what you'd seen the last time. Uh, you're off stage for an hour or an hour and a half. So you must bring on in every single scene as if you were performing in a one act play. And that didn't occur to me until way late in rehearsal, I was trying to link these scenes emotionally. And you really can't do it if you wanna be effective in every stage of his, um, demise. As far as bathos goes, I am um, inordinately aware of, of trying to keep away from that in anything that I do. Uh, I, my goal is to have the audience feel, not me. I'm there to make them observe a human being in crisis and see themselves in that. Makes great sense. In my small experience, very small experience in theater, I uh, learned that if you cry, they won't. Exactly. And uh, if you laugh, they won't. And if you are aware ever of what effect you're having on them, you will lose them. The whole point is never let them see you acting. Yes. <laughs> try, to be as, try to be as believable as you can so that they lose themselves in you, uh, not even in you in the character and the play and what the playwright has asked you to do, be a vessel. And today, I think too many performers are very aware of their effect and I lose interest after a few minutes. Modern singers sing with their mouths. They don't sing with their hearts anymore. It's, it's all right, it's all right. You, that, that strategy or, or um, uh, just the looking at the plan of one, a Lear in one scene and a Lear in another scene and Lear in a, Lear in a third scene. In any other play or a lesser, with a lesser writer, and since all the other writers were lesser writers to Shakespeare, that confusion would just be confusion. But here, the confusion seems to lead to mystery. It deepens the mystery of the character. Yes, well, it, I, I like to think in the Lear that I played that there were major revelations hitting him every moment. And as I said earlier, the biggest one is, uh, oh my God, I'm not loved. They don't yeah. love me. They don't love me. They were just doing what they were told because they were afraid of me. And I foolishly start the play by saying, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to cut up my kingdom and you're going to tell me how much you love me so I can decide how much of it to give you. And, uh, and it takes him a long time. This is why he goes ballistic in so many scenes in the middle of the play, trying to get the daughters to, I don't understand, he calls them carbuncles and all sorts <laughs> of things. I don't understand why you're not listening. One of the traps of Lear, and I've seen it played by a number of actors, uh, is not to start him off losing his mind, you know, already in dementia, in order to make excuses for his behavior. My Lear was very clear, very much a bastard in the beginning, very aware of his power and what he wanted to do. He was just unaware of the human side. So that um, I didn't want to make excuses for his behavior by saying, oh, I'm demented. He knows right. exactly what he's doing. And he right. And he, he, he thinks that his final years are going to be traveling from ca castle to castle and everybody's gonna kiss his ass all the time. He doesn't ever think it's not, it's, 
it's anything but love. And when he finds out, he's devastated. You know, oddly enough, dementia has a strange beauty of its own. Your brother, I think, had dementia. My mother died of yeah. uh, dementia. And there's always a moment in it when you think, um, is there something there that I'm simply not reaching rather than a rather than the exposure of a disease? I, my, I remember my mother was um, strangely funny with self-awareness until the disease got too much. And my wife and I took her to lunch. And I said something banal, like we should do this again sometime, mom. And she said, yes, but the next time we should invite Joseph Cotton. <laughs> I, said, I said, mom, we don't know Joseph Cotton. Uh, she said, uh, well, you have to ask him because he knows what your dialect is from any part of the country. You can tell where you come from. I said, mom, are you thinking of Rex Harrison uh, um, uh, or uh, uh, what's his name in the Pygmalion? Uh, are you thinking of uh, Professor Higgins? And she smiled and with self-awareness and said, yes, I am. But as long as we have invited Joseph Cotton, I don't think we should renege. <laughs> I had a friend whose mother had dementia. The grandmother had dementia. And he'd take her to lunch once a week. And she would say, as, as they were driving home, did I have lunch? And he would say, yes. And she said, did I enjoy it? <laughs> My brother... Um, I learned a great deal about the disease with my brother, and I learned the things I did wrong in the early days. Huh. Um, what you must do with a dementia patient is exactly what you did, except everything they say is gospel, and of course, that's true. And the way I learned it was very painful. I brought my brother, he loved chocolate donuts with sprinkles, as indeed do I. Uh -huh. I brought him one, in a paper bag with a ribbon. And I put it in front of him and said, this is something I know you like. And he just stared at it. He wouldn't go near it. He, I, and I pushed it closer to him and he wouldn't take the ribbon out. So I took the ribbon out and I opened the bag and I said, look inside. And he sort of looked, but didn't want to. And I made the colossal error I'm sticking my hand in the bag and holding the donut under his nose. And he screamed because uh. I didn't know what the donut meant to him. And on that day, I realized that I was never again to try to make him do anything or try to say, no, that's not true. Just say, of course. Yeah, of course. Your, your motives were pure, but they enter another world. Yeah, uh, he saw... He always saw mice crawling up the window shades and I would always go and shoo them away and he'd say, thank you. Ah, yes, ah, yes. Um, this goes back to Lear and somewhat to Judge Hoffman, another old man you played recently and, and brilliantly, but it, it seemed to me a much simpler role and yet you made it, you made it seem complicated. I can't quite figure that out. All Judge Hoffman did was yell at people for the entire movie, but uh, the, Every time he um, gave one of his snorts or, or, or his shouts, uh, indicating what prejudices he had, he seemed to be speaking for an era, not just for a man. Yes, I agree. And um, even more than that, uh, most bullies, uh, as indeed we know with the current one, are cowards, right. frightened, deeply and profoundly frightened of themselves. And my thoughts about it, the judge were, he was beginning to slip into not being quite sure of the name of that person or looking at his papers and where am I and what am I doing? I know I'm, I've, got to, I've got to convict these guys, that much I know. You're right. But when in fact you're losing, um, I think it's is true of all of us, particularly at our age, when you're beginning to lose um, the surety that you've had all your life. I know I can run down the subway steps. I know I can um, seduce a woman. I know I can learn this part very quickly. I know what my gifts are. I know what I have. And then one day you realize that you don't, you can't right. quite run down the subway steps anymore without grabbing. And the thing about that knowledge, I think, is not to be afraid of it, but to grab it, you know, grab the thing and say, now I need this in order to. Uh, that's, that, that's because you're both brave and talented. A lot of people would run away from it. 
Yeah, um, I don't know. I think maybe it's when I started losing my hair that I decided. Uh, that I, terrible moment. I hated every moment of that. I, and yeah. I, I wish I could preserve every hair in a museum. No, no now um, I, it's gone. I like it. <laughs> what you look like. You look marvelous. And thank the, you. <laughs> you bet. Um, I want to go back to something Keats had a phrase called negative capability, which he applied to Shakespeare, which he simply meant that you have to live with the burden of the mystery, the burden of the mystery. And in every one of the characters you play, you seem to uh, um, bless them with a kind of burden of the mystery. Nothing is simple. It doesn't mean that we're lost in some, in, in, in some confused morass, but we never look just once at a character that Fra Frank Langella plays. Even, even in the Americans, I remember you and I met when you were doing the Americans, you seem to treat it like, you know, just easy as pie. I get off the subway, I go to the set, I do the job. But I will tell you as a, an appreciative uh, viewer, you held that show together. You, the old Russian man, you were the center of that show. Well, I, I beg to differ. Uh... I thought the two young actors who were the they were wonderful people. and they, and they, they are wonderful. But yeah, when, when, were you the appeared, when you appeared, gravitas appeared. I came and went. But to your point, it came very young to me I, I, in my life. I didn't achieve it for a while, but that there are two things an actor must have in order to aspire to greatness. One is mystery, and the other is danger. Uh, you have to be the animal in the jungle that nobody looks away from. You have to be the cobra. You have to be the lion about to pounce. You can't be the bunny rabbit and you can't be the nice calm because oh, how cute you are and pet you. I always want audiences on this when I'm on the stage to be worried that I'm going to come out and get them <laughs> and to wonder what it is I'm thinking. And I came to that late in the screen. I, I've come to a, a fall, I've fallen in love with the lens in a way I always fell in love with audiences and trying to put into that lens mystery and danger, trying never to get you to sit back comfortably and say, oh, I know what this is. You know, this is character number 607. I've seen him do it before, which is what a lot of actors of my generation unfortunately have come to be, franchise actors. They know what they've got and they play it. Yeah, um, but you you never do. And I certainly didn't mean to diminish my appreciation of the two stars, uh, the two young stars of- I know you did, I know you but, did. But, but when, you step, when you would come on, as briefly as it was, um, they paid a kind of obeisance, not because you, you were in effect their boss, but because you gave a center of a very complex civilization. It wasn't us against them. It wasn't Americans against the Russians. It was a whole, it was as if you had gone to the depths of Russian history and stood there bringing it to them. Thank you. Um, and I didn't, I, by no means did I mean you were. It's just that television series, when there are two young actors like that, six years and in almost <laughs> every scene, they hold it together. What I did was come in and try to represent what used to be. There's a line in, I think, close to my last scene where he looks at uh, Carrie and says, it adds up, that's all. It, it is, they're asking him why he's going home. And I wanted to say, because the writers said, <laughs> I didn't say that. I said, <laughs> no, it adds up and it gets harder and harder. And it just adds up without self-pity with just you know, it's, it's, it, yes but it, never with self-pity and it's funny that it adds up could be the epitaph for us all the the um to go back to a frightening character um frightening in a very complex way because he was so smart too was nixon uh did you enjoy playing nixon in frost nixon both on stage and in the film after four weeks of agonizing rehearsal i loved him and uh, matter of fact, that night of the uh, Oscars, uh, when I lost um, Tony Hopkins, who had played him in another film many years before for Oliver Stone, walked over to me and said, did you come to love him? Uh, uh. I said, completely. I, I, I worshiped and adored him as a character to play. He was, of course, a crook, 
less of a crook than we currently have, but he was a crook. <laughs> but the things I loved about him, and I, I spoke with Tony only briefly, were the depth of his pain and insecurity. Yes. I, I drove out, uh, I, I had a lucky accident. I had a plane that was delayed by six or seven hours when I was in Los Angeles. And I quickly called, um, uh, I think it was Ron Howard's office. And I said, do you think you could warn them that I might drive up to the Nixon library? And they right. said, sure, come ahead. And I spent five hours in his office reading the notes he'd written in the De Gaulle book about what it takes to be a leader. And then I went to the house he grew up in, which they'd moved to that site. And I went up the steps that were smaller than my shoulders, had to turn that way, and mm -hmm. sat on his bed with a ceiling that I couldn't stand up fully in a tiny little window. And he, he grew up in that room with three brothers. So all of those things informed um, what it, I, it, it, that, the, it, it was wonderful to the opportunity <laughs> to absorb all that. Did you ever meet him? No, I, I've been very fortunate. I've met, and probably because I'm very old, I've met five presidents in my life, but Nixon wasn't one of them. Me, me too, and I did meet Nixon under the following circumstances, which were uh, memorable. Um, I was not doing something on Nixon. I was doing a cover essay for time on our anniversary of Hiroshima, but I wanted to discuss nuclear diplomacy and he was the one who had his finger on or near the button more than any other uh, president. So they arranged a meeting on July 4th of all, of all times and the air conditioning was off in this government building downtown. He was sitting in a suit, of course, and I'd put on a suit to be with the back president, any president, sitting in a corner and I put my uh, uh, tape recorder in front of him and I, uh, and I said, is it okay if I record this? And he looked at it and he said, oh, that's one of those new tape recorders. It's so much better than the old tape recorders. <laughs> I did not laugh. I didn't know, I didn't say, yes, Mr. President, these don't skip a minute. I didn't, I didn't know if he was joking or not. It was, um, it was on to his- From everything I, everything I learned about him, he wasn't joking. He, he didn't have much to say. Um, I remember being told a story, and I can't remember if it was President Clinton who told it to me about, uh, they invited him to the White House, and he arrived with three speeches in his head. One was to Clinton about the current problems of the world. The other was to Hillary about certain medical issues that interested her at the time. And the third was to Chelsea about her classes. And oh, dear God. And when he was done, he was done. And he hey. sat in his chair silently for the rest of the afternoon. That takes me to something, Roger, that uh, we hit on before. You should never be aware that you're a king when you play one. You should mm -hmm. never be aware that you're a president when you play one. That's what you happen to be. But what you are, is something very different. And how much you use your power to maintain that illusion or whatever. Um, and it's true of actors too. People often come at us with an idea of who and what we are. And depending on how much time you have and whether it's a quick hello or not, your mind is computing very quickly. Oh no, I'm not that. I, that's something you saw me do. And sometimes you use that image to your betterment. But if you use it too much in life, you end up in a terrible place. You should never, ever be a, a victim of your own image. No, you never, you, you never do that. And one is only aware of the character that you're playing. And right. one is always intrigued by the character you're playing. The best, the best, I think I've told you this before. I know I have. The best portrayal of a writer in film I've ever seen, and most people have ever seen, was you in Coming Out in the Evening. Starting out. And starting out in the evening. And I, I believe um, that was a small film, but its effect on people is, everybody I mention it to knows it and remembers it deeply. Was it interesting to make that film? Yes, I mean, if I can make a little joke, coming out in the evening was Dracula. Oh, that's so right. Coming out <laughs> in the evening was- uh, <laughs> Well, he made a bigger splash, I think. It was, uh, again, it was a perfect script. We made it for $850,000. Uh, 
We shot it in an apartment on the Upper West Side, 111th Street. We, there was no money. I Between takes, I went down to the local deli and bought everybody sandwiches. But when you have a character that beautifully written and a director anxious for it to be right and wonderful co-stars. You did. Makes it easier. I, ju I just loved what he... I, I, people complained about the title, but the title made great sense to me. There's a scene at the end of the film when he wakes up in his bed and makes toast and a cup of tea, sits him down, has them, and then walks down the hallway and starts typing, and that's the last shot, which it's is perfect. no matter what, you keep on going, you know. It's it, 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 it's perfect, and it's it, it's perfect in the writer's mind. I was a a good friend of Edgar Doctorow, and this could have been Doctorow uh, in another plot, in another uh, in another uh, series. The man who, above all, takes the word seriously and lives and also, for the word. The other part is because I have nowhere near to your extraordinary greatness or, or amount, but I, I have written. And uh, most of my career is collaborative and I'm surrounded by people. On a film set, when you're trying to create a single moment, there are often, as in this movie, trial, there were three or 400 people watching you every second, not to right. mention all of your co-stars who never left for a moment. But when you have to get up in the morning and, and uh, go write a chapter that's stirring around in your brain, um, it's joyous and uh, terribly lonely. You must know that. Yeah, yeah. Really, there's nothing more profoundly more sobering than the blank page in front of you. You're, actually, you're quite good with the blank page. Um, I was honored by your showing me some things you were doing. And if you want to stick with that, um, uh, you're, you're going to be uh, impressive in a couple of the uh, arenas, which is uh, which will be very nice to see. The, um, the idea of the writer as the solitary figure, of course, now with COVID, uh, our life, that is the writer's life, actually then yours and everyone's is solitary, but we're more used to it. Although it gives you the creeps in the sense to know that everybody's leading a solitary life. You but, on stage or you in film are solitary and not solitary. I'm not quite sure how you do that. Well, we go back to um, what I said earlier about mystery and danger, but even one more thing, which I've said before, a, a very dear friend of mine, an actor named Rene Aubergenois died about six months ago. And he gave me four or five signs that he made of things to follow. Mean it was one of them. And I can't, I don't remember all of them, but the one that I carry with me to every dressing room, film or stage is this one, leap empty-handed into the void. Yeah. And by that, over the course of the years, when I was a very young actor, I would stand in the wings for right before half hour, I'd be there done up in my costume and I'd be in whatever frame of mind I thought I needed for the next, for the first scene. And I always tried to do my best, but as I got older, I realized that if I've done my work, if I've learned the lines, if I know what they mean, and I mean them when I say them, I can have a, com a conversation with somebody up until seconds before I enter. And then I leap into ah. the, I don't think what's my line, I don't think that, I just have complicated my day terribly with lots of, you know, argue with your girlfriend or, uh, fight with a friend or your parents call and you don't want to take out the garbage. If you fill your life with all of those things and you get to the theater and you get your costume on at the last second and you run down to your entrance, you take a breath and you leave. And it's far more exciting than standing in the wings preparing because, forgive the expression, but you shoot your load in the wings and yeah, exactly. you want it to happen on stage. The same, the same is true in writing. You have about 10 seconds in writing to grab the reader by the lapels and say, you must read this. Yeah. So you do it by leaping into whatever you're writing. 
right. being, being, be it a poem or a story or, or anything. I don't it's, know. I often don't know the end of a sentence when I start writing it. You're not supposed to. Exciting. And, 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 or, or the end of anything when you're supposed to. I tell my writing students, do not write outlines. Do not know where you're going. Start, uh, start as firmly and as strongly with as much knowledge as you have at the beginning and then follow as Alice followed the rabbit, follow, uh, uh, follow your conscience or your subconscious or uh, something or the images that come to your mind and you will be uh, rewarded. And don't, don't try to have an effect. Don't, um, don't judge yourself as to whether this is good or not. Write it. I'm not as good at this as I'd like to be. Put it away, forget it. Keep on writing something else the next day. And don't go back for a long time. And then when you do, you go, wow, did I write that? That's terrible. Uh, that, that happens to me all the time. And then uh, uh, did I write that sentence? Where did that come from? And it's a, an eternal mystery. And also about the morality of certain characters. You played Claire Quilty in, uh, in Lolita. Um, in some ways, the most interesting character, <clears throat> who's entirely amoral in some way, but all of Nabokov in Lolita, in any case, is an amoral. You, in the sense, the book celebrates a criminal activity. What rescues art from the condemnation of immor immorality? What rescues art? Yeah. Why should we? Sh why should we forgive Nabokov for pedophilia? Well, I don't think it's our position to condemn or forgive. I Good. think it's our, I think it's our position to take what's in front of us, try not to be judgmental about it, but to allow allow ourselves to be moved by it in whatever direction the author intended. I I try on the other side of that, never ever to judge any character I'm playing. I didn't, uh, think, I didn't think when I came on uh, in the first scene of uh, Trial of the Chicago 7 that I was a bad guy. Right. I just thought, oh, God, it's starting. And I, I knew that I was going to convict them from the first moment. So it was, uh, here I go, and, I, and I'm going to be very impatient with these people because the wonderful actors all made me be that. But I... You don't know you're a villain when you're a villain. You think you're the hero. And also, when you're demented, in the play I did uh, three years ago called The Father. The Father was wonderful. Yes, which, by the way, Tony's going to do as a, a film, probably, ah. probably beautifully. Um, I, it never occurred to me that I was demented. They were all wrong. Every right. What do you mean that's cherry pie? Are you crazy? What do you mean you're my daughter? Oh, she's nuts. We got to do something about her. And that that was helped for me by the director, Doug Hughes, who mm -hmm. said, they're all wrong. Every one of them is wrong. And what it does, not only in playing a character who's losing his mind, is it, it allows you to rid yourself of the cliches of, oh, what uh, you just are fighting. I remember Doug saying to me, let me watch you fight it rather than give in to it. And going all the way back to your first question about Lear, I came to the conclusion that this was not a man losing his mind. This was a man finding his mind. Mm -hmm. He had lived all of his life unaware of himself, unaware of his stubbornness, his selfishness. And one day when people didn't jump, when he said jump, he had to, he had to face himself. Pity, there will be no epiphany like that in, on the 20th of January. <laughs> Not at all. No, sir. The, the wonderful thing about the portrayal of Judge Hoffman, or one of many, is that he allows the others their morality because he is so prejudiced, because he's so obviously prejudiced, because he represents all the prejudice of the era against the, uh, the uh, those of us fighting against Vietnam or any uh, uh, or any of those young people in the at uh, the trial. Your portrayal of him gave those young actors strength. 
Thank you. I hope so. But did you mean morality or mortality? I forget what I say, so please don't hold. That I allowed them their morality. Uh, yes, uh, the, 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 the yes, the, the moral suasion of their cause. Yeah, I um, I take the compliment. Thank you. I can't say that it was always on my mind, but what was on my mind always, always, apart from in between takes, marveling at these dozen actors, and I'm not just uh, blowing smoke was one of the greatest experiences I've ever had. In Isn't that wonderful? That's great. Every single one of them, every single, of course, we're all actors and we're vain and there's ego in this competition. But <clears throat> thanks to Aaron Sorkin's words and his incredibly kind direction, tough when he needed to be, all of us became clear-cut individual characters and playing off each other every day. You were mm -hmm. never, you could never do a scene in this movie without the entire cast in front of you. So whenever they were on me, I was looking at 12 of them. And whenever I was off camera, uh, I, no, whenever they were, I was off there, I was looking at them and when they, they were looking at me. I uh, watched all of their faces constantly and they watched me constantly. So people have written that this is a really fine ensemble. And it I, is, it's a glorious antagonist. It's the best ensemble I've ever been in. Isn't that wonderful at this age? Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, you have talked about the hazards, occupational hazards of growing old. What are the occupational advantages? Advantages? Mm -hmm. Oh, there are many. Many, many, many. One of them is that you come to the understanding that all that really matters are the fundamental things. <laughs> who loves you? Who you love? Am I kind? Am I less judgmental? Right. Am I more willing to allow people to be who they are without saying, now let me tell you something about yourself, which I did a lot of when I was younger. <laughs> um, good food. <laughs> nice. Occasional lovemaking. Very occasional in your case. Long, long conversations with very old friends. Yes, yes, yes. You have a language. Uh, you have a language with them. My, my, almost one of my very first girlfriends. We we toured around with a lot of other kids in Europe when we were seventeen years old. I've kept her as a friend all my life, and. Her husband was my closest friend. That history becomes very, very warming and uh, real. There are a lot of advantages to old age if you, if you give in in the right way. You know, what's not good is to do this. You know, or put, <laughs> you know, put plugs in your head. A friend of mine said he was going in for major plastic surgery. He was seventy-eight years old. Oh, Christ. And I said, why do you want to do that? He, he said, I want, to look, I want to keep working. I said, well, now you're going to compete with 60-year-olds. <laughs> and uh, there are more of them than you. Look <laughs> like a good 78-year-old. Don't try to look like a 60-year-old. <laughs> it's not always easy. It isn't. Uh, but what a, one right. of the incredible things about your playing Dracula was, I don't know what age Dracula is supposed to be. Well, he's 500. <laughs> and he doesn't look a day over 460. Oh, no, he doesn't. And also, penetration to Dracula means something entirely different than it does to an ordinary man. It's here. <laughs> and your teeth are always hard. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. You, you are, you, uh, the whole idea of sexuality, either in theater or in life, how strong is it? How strong is it supposed to be? It's everything. I was once sitting with a group of very well-known actors on a matinee in New York City. We were all doing shows and we gathered every Wednesday at Orso or Joe Allen's. And I foolishly told them that I, my idea was that everything I looked at was phallic or <laughs> that, you know, you know, uh, here's a pen, it's phallic. Here's a glass, it's phallic. <laughs> And, and I said, don't you all see that? I think the next urge is the urge, the most common in your life. 
when you're getting a lot of it, when you're not getting any of it, all of that. And Ron Silver, bless his heart, they were all making incredible fun of me. And as we, as we came out onto the street, there was an empty parking lot across the way. And Ron said, there's a big vagina waiting for you. Over there. <laughs> but, oh, I, I think it's everything. And I think that people are ruled by it. And by that, I don't mean the cliche of when you're a young man, you're always ready. And when you're an old man, you're not. And I just think people are very much more than they think they are affected by their sexual desires. We may return with that subject to the idea of mystery again, since sexual, all sexual activity seems mysterious, at least to me. The, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the urges, the pleasure, the, the uh, you should pardon the expression, coming and going of it. Well, I think when I was uh, about 40, I was, I was, God help me, I was one of the sex stars of Playboy magazine, only because I was playing Dracula and he's <laughs> a very sexual character. And they asked me in this interview, was there anything better than sex? And I wanted to appear, you know, butch and strong. So I said, no, there's nothing better than sex. And, the, and I, when I got home that night, I said to the woman I knew what it was like, and I answered the question about, was there anything better than sex? And she said, what did you say? And I said, no, of course not. She said, well, you're wrong. There's one thing better than sex. And I said, what? She said, the anticipation of it. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> takes a woman. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but, it almost always takes a woman. Yeah. You know, it's funny about anticipation in, in writing, anticipation trumps surprise, pardon the verb, but anticipation, anticipation trumps surprise all the time that, you know, something is going to happen and you're sure it's going to happen. You're absolutely sure it's going to happen. And it happens is far more effective than some sudden surprise where you're turned around and uh, uh, your mind wasn't involved at all. Well, to that, I can speak because as we just discussed with sex, there's something else that all human beings share and that he and many, many others, particularly despots, uh, are affected by. We all are, but we're not all demented. And that is when we're growing up, we're a little baby computer and our parents are typing into us what they want that day from us. You will do it this way, you will do that. And no child is going to um, turn away from those influences because we want to eat, we want to be warm, we want to be changed, we want to be loved. So we do what they tell us. And then if you're lucky, and I know very few people who are being, who have been raised by intelligent, loving, kind human people, everybody's flawed. So most actors come from madness. I did. Yeah. Family. You get older when you reach the age of reason or a little bit older, and you wonder why you're attracted to that woman. Or you wonder why you have a tremendous anger towards authority. Or you wonder why you cry so easily at this event. Or because your computer is set at an age when you have no ability to say, oh no, let me press delete. So right. what, you cut, what you carry with it the rest of your life is constantly reacting to things that were put into your little brain when you were tiny. What happens when that's destructive? What happens when you are helpless to um, uh, rearrange the elements in the computer and you're aware of it, but you can't do anything about it? You're never helpless, ever. What you are is, uh, I think, um, I spoke to a friend of mine last night who said when I, when I was expressing to him that I haven't acted since this movie, I've been trying to write and stuff. And he said, I'm not worried about you. You always move forward. Mm. And I do, but to, to the point you just raised, um, what you owe yourself and the other people in your life 
is just that, an awareness of what pushes your button, you know, what sets you off and learning how to say, that sort of thing should no longer make me angry or should, I should no longer defy that person. And in terms of love, I always like to say, you know that song from is it South Pacific, Some Enchanted Evening? Yeah. You may see a stranger, you may see a stranger across a crowded room, fly to her side. Well, I wouldn't have written fly to her side. I would have written run because <laughs> What happens is when you see that stranger across the room, you're not going towards her, except as the child in you. Yeah. And then you wake up and go, I married her. Why did I do that? Because, <laughs> because when I was little, that was my definition of love. And she somehow encompassed it. You know, most a friend of mine once said this, and I tend to agree, it's rather cynical. Most people marry their oppressor. Worse. Well, I mean, you had the ability to fly to her side when you were Dracula. <laughs> yes. Yes, I did. But for reasons uh, different than the mere mortal. I just, <laughs> I just needed a cup of blood. That's what I needed. <laughs> who do, and who does not? Yeah. You, you're, you're hardly at the end of it, but you're at a wonderful point in a life and a career. And you look around, what do you see? What do you see of the world, as a matter of fact? Well, I, I, I was, I'm a little younger than you, but we're roughly uh, COVID, and said, I think I've seen everything. You can't show me anything else. Then along comes Trump, then along comes COVID, and I realized that life absolutely is uh, astonishing. Yeah. I, when I was a very young man, it, I was married young first time at 21 or 22 years old, and I was in a very successful play and off Broadway. And my wife worked, she was a nurse and I was working. We weren't earning lots of money, but then everything was cheap, you know. At the end of the week, I'd get my paycheck, which was $48 and we would go to the market and on $5, we had enough food for the week. <laughs> but I, um, I always had a yearning to go and do things that I uh, thought I either wasn't capable of or what's around that corner. I would take all the money I had out of the bank and I would, I would give my notice in the play and I'd say to her, I'll see you soon. And I'd go to the airport and say, where are the planes going and what can ah. I afford? And I'd get on one and I would always save my money to, that I had enough to get home. And uh, I still feel that way. And I think what the gentlemen in COVID have done is, for a while, make that spirit inside of us dead. You know, I can't run yeah. to the airport. Right, uh, right. Friends of mine have asked me to come down to South Carolina and I'd love to, but I can't fly. I won't fly and I certainly can't drive that distance. The, if you play it right, the inner journey is what we're all on now yeah. is worth taking. And you sometimes realize the journey to a foreign land or the journey to a museum, all the things that we do to occupy ourselves, while many of them are extraordinarily life enforcing, a great many of them are very dangerous. They're distractions that keep you from the inner journey because at this age, as we are, there's only maybe a decade left or compass, yeah. who knows? I could forget your name by the end of this interview. It's <laughs> possible for all of us. And um, so earlier when you asked me about old age, I would say, take the high road. There's no traffic. You know? nobody's, nobody's driving on it. And I, I quote George Bernard Shaw ad nauseum because along with Shakespeare, I regard him as one of our great playwrights. But George Bernard Shaw said in um, Heartbreak House, life has a way of slipping through your fingers, but if you stick to your soul, it will stick to you. Ah, uh, nice. And it's beautiful, it is. I don't know where we are in the time, kind of time they've allotted us, but uh, if we are where it feels like, I would say that 
we are all, that is all, the, all your audiences for whom I luckily speak at the moment are very grateful for your wanderlust and for the search for your soul. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs>